This is a series of videos about the United Nations Agenda 21, also known as Sustainable Living. There is no way that I can possibly cover everything that is in Agenda 21 in one video because the UN has been working on Agenda 21 for well over 20 years. So I will go over Agenda 21 by area. In this video we will be looking at Agenda 21 and geoengineering and how it affects our climate. Next you will see a member of the South Australian Legislative Council, the Honorable Anne Bressington. She very eloquently and passionately speaks about Agenda 21. Please be assured this is a global issue and lawmakers around the world should be speaking out about this and blocking it. I first stumbled across Agenda 21 uh, in about 2008 and quite frankly my first uh, re reaction was to dismiss what I was reading because I didn't believe that any government in Australia would take us down this road. Then I began to see um, a legislative pattern emerging in Parliament which concerned me greatly and I also started to see the tenor of legislation that we were passing. I did air those concerns in Parliament and it was dismissed and ignored. Um, the words Agenda 21, ladies and gentlemen, were never meant to be spoken. And if they were, then of course it would be dismissed as a conspiracy theory. Because if people knew Agenda 21 and what it stood for, there's plenty of information out there where they could actually learn uh, what the end game was and governments didn't want that to be known. My dad always said to me that people only lie for two reasons. One reason is because you're ashamed of what you're doing and the second reason is that you don't want people uh, to be warned just before you screw them. And I honestly believe that these secrets have been, thank you, <laughs> that these secrets have been kept um, for both of those reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, the origins of the environmental movement as we see it began back in 1968 when the Club of Rome was formed. The Club of Rome has been described as a crisis think tank which specialises in crisis creation. The main, purpose of this, um, the main purpose of this think tank was to formulate a crisis that would unite the world and condition us to the idea of global solutions to local problems. In a document called The First Global Revolution, authored by Alexander King and Bertrand Schneider, on pages 104 and 105, it stated, In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers, of course, will be caused by human intervention that will require a global response. That's the origin of global warming, ladies and gentlemen. In the first global revolution, M refers to pages 104 and 105 about human intervention making water shortages, famine and the like. This is caused by geoengineering. It was first referred to as cloud seeding and it dates back to the late 1940s, springing from a discovery at the General Electric Labs in Schenectady, New York, 1946. Listen to this concerned citizen as she bravely speaks to her local lawmakers on this. My name is Chantal Nelly. I'm a mother of five and local activist here in Fresno. I'm here to ask once again that you investigate geoengineering, the very sensual the very essentials to sustain life on Earth are being recklessly <coughs> destroyed by geoengineering, causing massive animal and plant die-off around the world, as well as human illness. Earth is under an all-out weather warfare assault. Our atmosphere is nothing but a physics lab to scientists who have no concern whatsoever about the consequences to humanity or any living thing. While scientists propose that geoengineering is used for reversing the effects of global warming and cooling the planet, I have seen enough evidence to disagree. Every morning, almost, I look out my window in horror. I watch chemtrails be sprayed from planes, lines and X's cover the horizon. The sky is filled with nanoparticulates of heavy metals such as aluminum, barium, and stromium. These particulates are used to block the sun out, which we need. I watch for hours as these chemtrails turn into a toxic blanket across the sky. 
I'm watching my children and everyone I love being slowly poisoned and cannot do nothing about it. It's brutally devastating to not be able to protect the people I love and our home. This is not a conspiracy. It's all published. Geoengineering is a part of Agenda, Agenda 21, that is. And if you don't know what this is, I suggest that you all research it because it's very scary and this is our reality. Autism, asthma, Alzheimer's dementia, allergies have all skyrocketed. Our ozone's being depleted. Oceans are on the brink of collapse. Species are going extinct. Trees and plants are dying. Our soil is being sterilized. Our water is poisoned. I do believe geoengineering is being used for both monetary and political gain at the expense of every living thing on the planet. If this is not aerosol pollution, I don't know what is. Last time I was here, we were laughed and mocked and pushed out of the building as the fire alarm went off. Funny thing was, though, we were the only ones pushed from the building. Why? This is bigger than you and me. I realize that. I simply state you guys do your job as the Air Pollution Board and raise awareness of the matter. If not, we need people who will. Geoengineering is pollution and genocide. I do not consent, and by staying silent, you are. Please wake up, look up, research. These are crimes against all humanity, and this affects us all. There's so much evidence and tons of patents for geoengineering and weather modification. Please, I beg you to investigate and help protect our community and future generations' right to clean air, water, and food. Your silent is consent. I take this very personally. This is an attack, and you all should be taking it personally. Thank you very Thank much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, the climate chaos that is going on today is not caused by driving SUVs. It's caused by geoengineering. California used to be known as the breadbasket of the world. Now it's turning into a dust bowl. Look up in the sky and you will see what I'm talking about. Look at the equipment in these planes. This is not a joke nor a conspiracy theory. This is real and we all need to understand what is happening to our environment and why. Next you will see experts from all walks of life explaining geoengineering and the effects it has on a population in a hearing in California. So let me go ahead and uh, outline a process for item number R7 so we can all be on the same page and understand what it is that we are doing this morning. Um, R7 is a discussion to receive input and discuss matters regarding geoengineering chemtrails. I'll proceed as quickly as I can now. So we have the issue of climate engineering and semantics are important. The, too much at media and other officials, not saying this board, they've been very courteous, but have not used the scientific terms and this is, this is not used for a reason because uh, the, the term chemtrails is not a scientific term so we try to avoid those terms. But when you see CBS News, Geoengineering to fight, go fight global warming is now mainstream topic conversation with all scientific organizations and with governmental officials, such as John Holdren, Obama's science advisor, who is actively advocating for the use of geoengineering. And again, this is, these are aspects that media does not cover because this would legitimize this issue. This would bring credibility to it. So we do have, again, science data that's it's too extensive to document here, but when we have current administration officials advocating for these programs and the immediate need to implement these programs, this subject should not be marginalized as it typically is by media. We see skies like this. Certainly, we have a lot of people telling us this is normal commercial traffic, that, it's, it's, <laughs> that this, is, this is normal. And, and that this is just random flights flying wherever they fly and that this stuff sticks in the air. But if this is random, that's not so random. Do we think the commercial aircraft fly in grid patterns? Again, the data is absolutely there, but we have major agencies telling us that this isn't so. In fact, there's, there's uh, a NASA document that says chemtrails aren't real. But again, they use a term that's not scientific on purpose. And at the same time, we have patents from NASA for geoengineering. So we have NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, admitting on the record that the atmosphere is now full of particulates and they don't know where they're coming from. So this is, 
this is quite astounding when you have the agency that's supposed to study this issue that's, that's literally um, unable to identify the source. When I spoke in front of the California Energy Commission in Sacramento, they acknowledged the state was losing 20 to 40 percent of its rainfall from, quote, particulates of unknown origin. But that investigation was never followed through. Uh, there's an investigation going right now with state water quality. I spoke to that representative. Their fishing game has acknowledged that there's aluminum running down the waterways. I spoke to the representative with uh, California State Water Quality who made it clear that they were not going to test the rainfall for this contamination. But isn't that where runoff comes from? So again, we have uh, an unwillingness to look at the obvious sources. This is so when we have satellite imagery of this happening and planes flying in, in loops and grids, and we have this material blowing in on us. It's coming from somewhere. And CARB, this is important. We know this metal's falling on us. We have, I furnished you guys today with about 40 lab tests uh, from the state certified lab showing a very, very substantial amount of metal. And again, aluminum does not exist in the environment in free form. That's important to remember because a lot of agencies try to say it's a common element. We should expect it. This is not the case. It doesn't exist in free form. So it's coming from somewhere in CARB. Geoengineering causing drought. All of us know we're being droughted out. For 10 years, I've said, because the science says so, that the more they aerosolize, the less it will rain here, period. So again, we have yet one more confirmation of when they spray upstream in our storm track, it diminishes and disperses our rain. Mr. Wigany, I'm going to ask a question. How yes. much time did we uh, have scheduled for? OK, has that already passed? Well, that was a 10-minute beeper. So, so let's do this. How much more time do you think? 30 seconds. OK, very good. We want seconds. you to be able to Thank conclude. You, Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, NOAA already deciding that we're not going to get rain from El Nino, which is astounding that they would know that so quickly. Another satellite photo, and, it, and this is hard to see on this screen, but the entire, we, people can view this at geoengineeringwatch.org, the entire Pacific is covered with grid patterns in this shot. It's hard to see. Prevalence of Alzheimer's disease going off the charts. Autism, 10,000% increase, known connection with aluminum, same with Alzheimer's and, and uh, dementia. Alzheimer's and autism, the common link. Aluminum exposure. Last slide, the right to know. That's all we're asking. The public has a right to know there's a public health hazard in regards to the heavy metal contamination and the UV radiation. That's all we're asking is for that disclosure. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you. Um, could you just really concisely, what do you believe the purpose of this engineered spraying is? I, will tell I mean this in all sincerity. What, what do you I, say I, the purpose of it is? I can tell you what the stated purpose is by governmental document and thank, U.S. tax. Yeah, right into yeah. that mic there. I, I can you. tell you what the stated purpose is, solar radiation management, SRM, to block the sun. That's the stated purpose. The, the consequences don't seem to be considered with these programs, but that is the stated purpose on almost all U.N. and global governance documents for these programs. Okay, and, and obviously you presented a great deal of material to, to myself and to other board members over the years, and that is the conclusion drawn. I just wanted to draw that out today because I didn't hear that specific language, so I wanted to make sure we state that. But then on a personal level, I have another question, and I've asked many people, and no one's been able to answer this question for me, so I mean this in all sincerity. Why does the spring create a drought in California and flooding in the Mideast, in the Midwest. Thank you for asking that question. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. When you aerosolize the storm track, and the science backs up what I'm saying word for word, you diminish and disperse the rain. This is not seeding to create rain. This is seeding to create artificial cloud cover. And mm -hmm. because there's too many condensation nuclei, it tends to disperse that moisture exactly as we've seen over California again and again. Back to my, my talk in front of the California Energy Commission, they recognized this fact. I spoke to their top scientist. When you have too many particles in the air, it diminishes rain. It does not augment it if those particles are too small. So it tends to migrate moisture from one place to another, creating drought and deluge. And this is very well documented from ma every major science institution, from MIT, Scientific American. These effects are known. So it's not a uniform effect. It tends to disrupt the hydrological cycle completely. So when you spray upstream in the storm track, it tends to migrate that moisture somewhere else where it comes down in a deluge. And that's exactly what we see. Thank you, Chairman Baugh. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Wiggins, and I just, I've had one statement here, and I want to see if you confirm that. Uh, in, in your belief of following through with this and trying to get situations resolved, is it because it is a public health hazard 
Is that one of your number one concerns, that this must be disclosed? That is our request of the board, because that is why these programs can go on and on and on, because media will not cover it until the actual effects are made known. And this contamination issue, again, is absolutely verifiable. Same with the UV issue. We can meter it for you. We have state-of-the-art meters. So, and we have corroboration from other science studies, so yes, that is the request of the board. We fully recognize the board has no power to deal with this issue, nor does CARB, uh, nor other state agencies. But the contamination issue is a public health hazard, and we believe that disclosure is necessary, required, and that's all we're asking is disclosure of the, the heavy metal contamination and the UV issue. That's, that's what we're asking for, yes. As a wildlife biologist, I've been watching the ecosystem collapse when you lose all your stream organisms, when you have aluminum overload in your streams, you're killing your microbial bacteria, and you're disrupting the entire ecosystem. So it goes way beyond just a little bit of pollution. Um, how did Monsanto know to create aluminum-resistant plants? I don't think I've heard anybody ask that question. Okay. So um, what I'd like to suggest to you. So that would be it, your notice to draw to a conclusion, please. Yes, sir, I was just going to do that. I would like to ask you to put a little bit of funding towards some real testing programs of snow and rain and vegetation. Now, I've tested lichens and found very high levels in the lichens, and they get all of their nutrients from the air and the rain. So it's a good guideline, and I think you would, you would find out a lot of things Thank to you, help Mr. support this. Francis Mangalis, followed by Jeff Nelson. Welcome. Greetings, gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity. I am a retired scientist, bachelor's cum laude in forestry, master's in zoology, 35 years, USDA scientist, soil conservation service, U.S. Forest Service, civil service equivalents in range, wildlife, fisheries, geology, agriculture, soils, ornithology, entomology, botany of mycology, hydrology. Am I qualified to speak? <laughs> Just letting you know it. Okay, these previous guys... I've watched exactly what they do, and yes, they are correct. I've seen exactly the same stuff, so ditto marks on those. Insects. I've done studies in Siskiyou County. They're at 20% of normal. The aquatic insects ma basically made a nosedive in 2006 to about 20% of normal. So far this year, I've sampled 200 trout stomachs. 98% of them are empty. So uh, sorry about the trout fishing, fellows. The mayflies, stoneflies, dipteris, and caddisflies are uh, damn near gone, except in the areas where there's so springs. I'm going to remind you to address the Board of Supervisors, please. The terrestrial sampling is down to about 20% of normal, except for pest species like ants. Uh, we're seeing a loss of the major bird species, and as the gentleman said, the ecosystem is unraveling, and Audubon's been telling you that for years. You want some figures? Okay, latest water test, tested the rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. So 13,100 is pretty damn much, folks. It used to be zero. Then it was 100s in the 2000s. And then in, uh, since 2010, it's into the 1,000s and the latest 13,100. In the snow on Mount Shasta, pristine Mount Shasta, 61,000 feet. No, excuse me. 8,000 foot level, 61,000 micrograms per liter. Four times the amount that is found in the soil up there. Where in the hell is this stuff coming from if it's not coming from the soil? Um, now, normal, again, it's, uh, you know, these tests are international in scope. We're seeing this all over the world, guys. Okay, pH of acid soils is 20 times more alkaline. The aluminum in the soil has doubled in the last 10 years. The rain normal was 5.6. It's 20 times more alkaline. Aluminum blocks essential nutrients. I am unable in my garden to restore normal pH, and that's because nanoparticles are now in the circulatory systems of both plants and humans. So welcome, fellow guinea pigs. Uh, the collapse and decrease of agriculture is something I worry about even more than the previous info about autism and Alzheimer's. Just about there, okay. 
See my paper, Geoengineering What We Know. The latest update is 7.11.14. It's available and nobody has been able to correct it or debunk it for five years. Thank and you, Mr. Mayor. The contrails, not the chemical, the contrails occur because of cold air, minus 30. It takes a high altitude, around 30,000 feet plus, and that air turns to, there's a carbon dioxide and water vapor in that exhaust. That turns to ice crystals, and that's what you see, the white stream behind it. Those white crystals uh, of ice um, um, warm up, dissolve, and the smoke goes away. And it never lasts more than a minute. Usually it's in seconds, depending on outside air conditions. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, and I started looking at the sky. I'm a neurologist practicing in Reading for 17 years. And in the past five years, I have seen the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases tremendously increased, almost quadruple. The explanation that they provide to us that the reason for increased number of these patients is because of increase in the population of aging people means that people are getting all older and stay alive because of progress of medicine, and that causes the uh, dementia uh, to surface up, does not seem very convincing. I'm not Fred Myers, but I'm stepping in for him. I'm Dr. Frank Lavolsi. I've been in the community since 1980. Um, it's good to see you, Dr. Lavolsi. Good to see you, too. Thank you for holding this meeting. Uh, I became interested in chemtrails about eight years ago when I was in Hawaii, and the Hawaiians are really being very vocal about it. Uh, every place I've gone in the world now, and most recently Quebec and Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Maine, and Massachusetts, they're all over the place. I'm also a pilot, and I've flown into Travis Air Force Base on several occasions. There's a whole area designated to replenishing these planes that fly and drop this chemical on us. It's totally guarded. The people that are loading these planes with the chemicals are dressed in complete hazmat outfits. So if this is not harmful, why are they in a complete hazmat outfit? For those of you who don't know what a hazmat outfit, it looks like a spacesuit. So they're wearing this and we're not. As a doctor, I can tell you there's been about a 25% increase in lung problems in this area and in most areas that they're spraying. Secondly, I concur about the increase in number of Alzheimer's. They have since been able to take the aluminum and micronize it, which means it'll stay up longer. But it also means, and I don't know if any of you have noticed some metallic taste in your mouth when they're spraying. But you inhale that, it goes up through your cribriform plate and into your, through your sinuses and into the brain. If you remember eight to 10 years ago, there was this big move to get rid of aluminum from underarm deodorant because it would cause Alzheimer's. <laughs> Look what they're doing to us now. Um, any agency I've called, I've been stonewalled. Oh, this is being put on by the UN. Now, since when does the UN have airspace activity over the United States of America, or also over any other country, for that matter. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I came here um, mostly as a person who's worked in the military industrial complex, worked on F-106s in the Air Force, had a secret clearance, worked as a uh, consultant to a variety of the top aerospace companies, as a conceptual artist and a designer. I've had uh, a secret clearance for a number of years, and I've worked on systems that are still classified today, 20 years later. Um, I want to give you a little bit of history on the background behind nanoparticles has been described before. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. It's very small. In fact, if you have particles, say, that are 40 or 50 nanometers across, you can take and line 50 of them up next to a single red blood cell. These things are extremely tiny. They're pervasive. The manufacturing processes, there's probably five or six different ones that I know of. There's probably others. 
But the explosion of nanotechnology has grown since the late 1980s, early 1990s, and is now growing exponentially. If you've ever seen or heard of a grain silo explosion, where particles of grain grind against one another, produce a dust, and then one spark will set it all off in an explosion. This is kind of exemplary of what nanoparticles represents in terms of the impact that they have on the environment. Because you can spread so many small little particles through the environment, it dramatically increases the surface area that's in that environment because there's so many of them. When you look up at the sun and you see a white haze, that is aluminum floating in the air right now, and it's coming from the aircraft. Now, as it happens, the Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. So it suppresses your immune system. But they also found that these same particles, once they get into your system, they can actually go through the barrier in each one of the cells. They get inside the cells, and these particles can actually suppress the ability of mitochondria which are in the cells that help to gobble up toxins and things that would be harmful to the nucleus and the, the reproduction process of the cells in your body. These processes are suppressed. And so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. Now, in addition to this, the materials that are going into the environment right now, aluminum oxide nanoparticles and barium nanoparticles, these just happen to be the same materials that they use in nanothermate explosives. And so when this stuff settles down out of the air into the environment, it is small enough to be absorbed through the root structure of the trees and the forest. And so when there's a forest fire, and there will be a forest fire, those fires burn dramatically hotter. This is just the tip of the iceberg with Agenda 21. The things that are in this proposal are truly horrifying, but it's all there in black and white and in their own words. I beg you, please don't take my word for this. Please take the time to see what's in there for yourself and do your research. We can stop this if we band together. Thank you for watching. I will post all the links at the bottom.